the thesis came out as a new technology called liquid neural networks. These are a new type of neural network that we will be talking about. And um, yeah, so I'll give it to Alexander to talk a little bit more about his background. Awesome. It's great to see everyone again. Uh, my name is Alexander Amini. I'm also a co-founder. I'm the chief scientific officer of Liquid AI. So a little bit about my background. I went to MIT for my bachelor's, master's, and PhD. I recently completed. While I was at MIT, I was really passionate about how we could build AI systems that weren't just really accurate, but were reliable and robust enough that they could solve the most critical and most powerful problems that, that exist today in the world. So while at MIT, during my PhD, I started working very closely with Ramin and, and with Daniela to invent this new type of uh, paradigm for AI modeling called Liquid Neural Networks. We'll tell you more about it in a moment. But uh, we're really excited about this technology because it is a new type of foundation model. Uh, it's very expressive, very powerful, and very reliable for the, for the different types of applications that we have in mind. Okay. Well, so um, uh, I'm also a co-founder of Liquid AI, and I have uh, uh, the great honor to have found brilliant students to come and work with me. I've been working on robot brains and robot bodies for many years. And a few years ago, I was at a conference and I went for a run with Professor Radu Grosso, who, is, um, who was uh, Ramin's PhD advisor at the time. And during this run, so this is when all the best ideas come, uh, when you take a shower or when you go for a run. Um, so during this run, I was lamenting about how um, today's AI models, or th uh, the then AI models, um, actually were, uh, were not good for safety critical systems uh, like robots and how they were really uh, too big to run on small machines. And at the time, Radu was thinking about the worm and the brain of the worm. So uh, one thing led to another and by the time we finished our jog, we decided that there was an opportunity uh, to work together on a new approach to machine learning and artificial intelligence that can, um, that can cope with safety critical systems, uh, that can lead to robust, compact models. And well, here we are a few years later. I think that was a pretty good uh, run that we did together. There are two approaches on designing intelligent systems. One is a complete algorithmic approach where you do not look into brains or something. You just try to find an algorithm can, that can solve complex tasks. This is where GPT is coming from. Generative pre-trained transformers, okay? So artificial neural networks originally were inspired by, uh, by brains and, and how brains perform computations, but they drastically shifted towards being something that is not uh, brain inspired. So those inspirations from the brain are gone. Now they become, be for, for, uh, at a kind of uh, with the motivation of making it more and more uh, efficient and building efficient algorithms that we can run and on a computer and on a hardware that is available to us. Then the other class which we started looking into is brain-inspired applications. Let's go back to the source and from first principles figure out what's the best way to really get the principles out of the brain of animals and actually humans, I mean, but we don't know that much about human brain, so we went one level of upgrade. So this worm is actually in the tree of evolution, is one of our fathers. So the kind of fun foundational kind of ideas that enables computation, the brain of the worm, also translate to the human brain. So intelligence can emerge from biologically inspired kind of systems. You can think about a liquid network as a kind of an artificial neural network uh, with a different mathematical function that defines the neuron and the different wiring between the neurons. And uh, the, um, the mathematical functions are inspired by the worm, by the brain of small animals. And the end result is uh, very compact uh, solutions to, uh, to, to very complex problems uh, that require huge models in the classical deep neural network models. So just to give you an example, with Ramin and Alexander, we looked at whether we can get our new model liquid networks, we can get it to uh, drive a car. 
Now, before Alexander developed uh, a really awesome deep neural network solution, uh, for that problem. So a deep neural network could take your car and drive it and steer it and find the destination. That solution required about 100,000 artificial neurons and about a half a million parameters. With a liquid model, the solution is down to 19 artificial neurons. So think about it, from 100,000 to 19 and on the order of a couple thousand parameters. And the computational savings is extraordinary. More importantly though, if you look at how the deep neural network solution makes decisions, and it makes pretty good decisions, but uh, it drives the car by looking at the bushes on the side of the road, which is not how you and I drive. We look on the road horizon, uh, and, uh, and that's, what, uh, uh, that's the most important signal for deciding how we steer. So, on the other hand, the liquid network solution uh, pays attention to exactly the same part of the, of the feedback of the sensory uh, input image that humans do. So, I mean, in some sense, you can think about deep neural networks as paying attention to context, and then you can think about um, the liquid networks as, as learning something more fundamental about the task. So basically, Ramin's talking about kind of the, the scale of algorithmic advances, and Danielle's talking about the scale of, of use cases. And basically, liquid neural networks, you should think of it as kind of pushing back on this paradigm that AI models have, have proposed to date, which is a paradigm shift where the better AI models require more compute, more data to scale them. Liquid neural networks are trying to push on a different paradigm and ask this question of, is there a fundamentally better model that is closer adapt to us as humans, that reasons about the world, like Daniela says, not looking at only at the context, but looking at the subject itself and paying attention to the pieces of the, 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 the environment that really matter to answer questions. Is there a better algorithm or a better model that, that can capture those properties such that we don't need to rely only on compute and only on data to achieve the same thing. If we had a model like that, it would be massively more efficient, it would be massively more powerful for the same amount of compute, and that's exactly how you should think of liquid neural networks. There are a couple of value propositions that we have with this type of neural networks. The first thing is that they are better at representation learning. They are better, they make more robust decisions. When you train them on a small amount of data, they can learn the essence of a task, okay? And this is not just learning a statistical model, but they learn a causal model. They learn basically how to do cause and effect. This is one of the foundational kind of properties of these networks and one value proposition. So if you want a more robust decision making, this is the type of networks that you want to use. Now, the second thing is algorithmic efficiency. As Daniela was mentioning, the size of these networks are very small. Not only that, but also the new mathematics that, we, that enables these type of networks enable you to understand these systems. You can probe these systems and explain the behavior of these AI systems. So explainability is the second mode that we have, you know? And at the same time, they're small and they're efficient. So we have three modes in place, and I think with this kind of technology, scale the same technology for applications in autonomy, in time series modeling, you know, financial time series, medical time series, in biotech kind of applications. And um, you can, you can uh, apply them also to language modeling because language can be modeled as a sequential kind of data problem, like it's a sequence modeling problem. So you can also apply it for language modeling. So we, there is a range of tasks. We have a universal signal processing system that can solve problems in a tractable way. You know, they're robust, they're efficient, and they're explainable. So these are basically the kind of things that you get if you use as a foundation model, instead of a GPT or a transformer architecture, a liquid foundation model or an LFM, basically. Companies no. who want to run generative AI in-house don't need to go to uh, partners anymore. With this technology, companies could have their own model uh, that can be run behind the firewall, that can use private data without the need to share it with third parties. So any kind of enterprise uh, level solution that requires uh, efficiency 
uh, that requires uh, a lower cost to run and that requires privacy uh, is enabled by this technology. The technology is really quite general. And on top of that, because, the, because of all the uh, interpretability aspects and the causality aspects of, uh, uh, of the solutions, we can also deploy it on edge devices where there is a need for safety critical solutions.